Welcome to another tutorial video. I'm taking the unusual step here of actually posting a corrected slash updated version of a video on this topic, equity value and enterprise value interview questions that we posted a few days ago to this channel. YouTube does not allow us to make corrections or updates to existing videos, so the only option is to delete them and then re-upload new versions. The reason why I'm posting a corrected version here is that one of the rules about how equity value and enterprise value change presented near the end of that tutorial is not accurate in 100% of cases. I would say it's probably 95 or 98% accurate, but I do feel the correction and clarification here are significant enough to warrant an update. Now, if you want to just get the correction, watch until the timestamp shown on screen. If you want the full version and you haven't seen the previous version of this lesson, then just skip to the timestamps shown on screen and we'll go through everything from the start and present the correct version of this definition. So here's the correction. There are no changes to the part about how enterprise value changes. If net operating assets change, then enterprise value changes. That's pretty simple and straightforward. But with equity value, net assets do not have to change for equity value to change. Now, they do change in probably 95% or 98% of cases, but not all 100% of cases. The counterexample to prove this is, what if a company issues $100 of preferred stock to repurchase $100 of common stock? Let's go into Excel and see what happens. So I have the same file here, but you see I changed it, and now we're only looking at common shareholders' equity changes to see if equity value changes. If a company issues 100 of preferred stock to repurchase 100 of common shares, shareholders' equity, common shareholders' equity goes down by 100, and so equity value changes. But on the balance sheet, if you think about it, our net assets, so total assets minus total liabilities, is 1,500 in one period and 1,500 in the next period. It doesn't have to change because preferred stock and common shareholders' equity, both within the equity category here, change. And so in this case, since equity value corresponds to the common shareholders of the company, if something there changes, then equity value will change and the second condition for net assets is not necessarily true. So you can leave that part out and it's also easier to answer questions because this rule is just simpler to think through. As a result, the overall rules here are, number one, does common shareholders equity change? If it does, then equity value changes. If not, then equity value does not change. And then two, do the net operating assets change? If they do, then total enterprise value changes. If not, then enterprise value does not change. And before someone leaves a comment saying something about this, yes, obviously the book values are much different from market values. Enterprise value and equity value measure market value. Net operating assets, common shareholders equity represent book value. I understand all that. However, the difference here is that we are dealing with the changes to equity value and enterprise value, and we're simplifying to answer interview questions. So no, these rules are not going to hold up 100% in real life, but these help you answer interview questions about what happens on the statements and what happens to enterprise value and equity value when various items change. So before you leave that as a comment or question or objection, no one is saying that the market value and book value are the same. All we're saying is that the change in one should result in some change in the other as well. With all that said, let's now go into the main part of this lesson and look at interview questions. The short answer here is that bankers will test you up to your point of failure. So enterprise value related questions are going to come up in any interview where they ask you about accounting or valuation or topics like that. If you understand the fundamentals and a few key rules, you can answer pretty much any plausible question here. These questions are probably less important than ones about accounting or DCF analysis, but I would say they're arguably more important than M&A and LBO ones, especially if you are relatively young and you haven't had much exposure to transaction analysis yet. So you need to know this topic for sure, but you don't need to spend time learning about the treatment of every single obscure item in the enterprise value calculation. Now, the typical progression of questions here is that they might start asking you for the basic definitions and the meanings of equity value and enterprise value and why they're important. Then they might ask about the basic calculations for them, including the treasury stock method for calculating diluted shares. They might ask about valuation multiples and how you pair equity value or enterprise value to create multiples. Then a more difficult question category is how equity value and enterprise value change after certain events, like issuing dividends or making acquisitions or purchasing inventory or plants, property, and equipment. And then finally, they might ask you about real life events and how those translate into the financial statements and how those affect equity value and enterprise value. Let's go to the first category here and go through the basic definitions. 
What do equity value and enterprise value mean and why are they important? I want the meanings, not the formulas. Equity value is the value of everything a company has, its net assets, total assets minus liabilities, but only to the equity investors or common shareholders in the company. Enterprise value is the value of the company's core business operations or its net operational assets, but to all investors, equity, debt, preferred, and possibly others. And when we say value here, if we're looking at the company's current equity value and enterprise value, this is really the market value of everything. If it's implied equity value and enterprise value, then it's your estimate of the value of everything the company has or the company's core business operations. The significance is that when a company's capital structure changes, equity value changes, but enterprise value does not change, at least not in theory. So if we go over and look at our example here, we have a company with an equity value of 10,000 initially and an enterprise value of 11,500. When we decrease the equity and increase the debt, the company's equity value goes down, its enterprise value stays the same. And then when we go a step further and now we increase the company's equity value and reduce its debt, equity value of course goes up, but current enterprise value stays the same because it doesn't depend on the cap company's capital structure, at least not that much. Now, if you understand those, then they might ask you about calculations. So how do you calculate equity value for a public company? Let's say the company has a share price of $10, 100 shares outstanding, and 10 options with an exercise price of $5. Equity value for a public company equals the share price times the diluted shares outstanding, and the diluted shares equal the basic shares, in other words, the number listed in the company's annual or quarterly report. Then you add in dilution from options, warrants, restricted stock units, convertibles, and other sources. For the options, you use the treasury stock method and you assume employees exercise their options, they pay the company to get new shares, and then the company repurchases some of those new shares. So in this example, let's go through it and see how the math works. Now these options are in the money because the exercise price is below the company's current share price of $10. So the employees exercise their 10 options for $5 each and the company gets $50 in proceeds. The shares we purchased here are five because $50 divided by $10 is five. And so we get five new shares. 10 shares get created, the company repurchases five. So there's a total of five additional shares now. The diluted share count therefore is 105 and the diluted equity value is $10 times 105 or 1,050. Now, if you get all that right, they might move on to the third category of questions, which is how to pair metrics with equity value or enterprise value to create multiples. A typical question here might be, why do you need to use valuation multiples like enterprise value to EBITDA when valuing companies? Why not just stop at equity value or enterprise value? And the short answer is that a higher enterprise value doesn't necessarily mean that one company is more valuable or more expensive. You need to look at it relative to the company's size or financial metrics. If two companies are similar in most ways, but one has a multiple of 15x and the other has a 10x multiple, then the one with a 10x multiple is a better deal, assuming, of course, that the companies are similar in most ways. One analogy that's often used to explain this is buying a house. And if someone asks you what's more expensive, a house that costs $200,000 or a house that costs $500,000, the answer is that you need more information to decide because it depends on the sizes of both houses, their locations, their conditions, their amenities. If both houses are about the same and also are about the same size, then it's easy. Obviously, the $500,000 one is going to be more expensive. But where it gets more interesting is what if the houses are very different sizes? Maybe one is 1,000 square feet, and that's the $200,000 one, and then one is 5,000 square feet, and that's the $500,000 one. In this case, we need a way to normalize the home prices, and we can start by looking at them on a dollar per square foot or dollar per square meter basis. So the first one is $200 per square foot. The second one is $100 per square foot. So from that perspective, the first one is actually more expensive and the second one is cheaper once you normalize for the sizes of these homes. And this is the point of valuation multiples with companies. You're trying to normalize for size so that you can compare companies that are similar in most ways, but which might be somewhat different sizes and you're seeing what's more expensive based on that. A follow-up question here might be, why do you pair enterprise value with EBITDA and equity value with net income? I want the explanation, not the formulas. The short answer here is that if the metric deducts net interest expense and preferred dividends if they exist, then you pair it with equity value in the numerator. Otherwise, you use enterprise value in the numerator. Interest expense is how debt investors or lenders are paid. After you subtract this interest expense, then they can't earn anything else. So they are completely in the picture and only the common shareholders, the equity investors are left after that, which is why you would have to pair any metric that deducts this with equity value. 
you could think of it like a funnel structure where metrics that are before interest and preferred dividends are at the top. Then these pair with enterprise value because the funds here are available to all the investors. But once you take out or subtract those interest and preferred dividends, then you remove the debt and preferred investors. And so after you do that, only the equity investors are left and they're the only ones that can get paid. So that's the third question category. Now the fourth question category here is how events affect equity value and enterprise value. A common question might be, a company issues $100 of dividends, how do equity value and enterprise value change? Or a company issues $100 of common stock and $100 of debt to purchase 100 of PP&E and 100 of investments. How do equity value and enterprise value change? The two key rules here are number one, does common shareholders equity change? If it does, then equity value changes. If not, then equity value does not change. Then the second rule is, do the net operating assets change? If they do, then enterprise value changes. If not, then enterprise value does not change. Let's go into Excel and look at these two questions and see how they work. So with this one for $100 of dividends, let's go up to our model here and try entering this. I'll delete the old numbers that I filled in in the first part of this, and then I'll say common dividends increases by 100 right here and you can see what happens. Our cash on the asset side goes down, and then on the other side, our common shareholders equity goes down by 100. Common shareholders equity is down by 100, therefore equity value will be down. No operating assets or liabilities have changed, so enterprise value does not change. This is just a financing change, so it's not going to affect enterprise value. Now, this second question with 100 of stock and 100 of debt for 100 of PP&E and 100 of investments. Let's go in and enter this and see how it works. So I'll say issue new shares increases by 100, issue long-term debt increases by 100, CapEx will increase by 100 because we spend something to buy the pp &E, and then buy financial investments increases by 100. So on the asset side, our pp &E is up by 100, our investments are also up by 100, so the asset side is up by 200 so far. On the liabilities and equity side, our debt is up by 100, and our common shareholders' equity is up by 100. So in this case, since common shareholders' equity is up by 100, equity value will also go up by 100. Now, in terms of operating assets and liabilities, the only one that changes is PP&E. Financial investments are non-operating, debt is non-operating, common shareholders' equity is non-operating. So therefore, our net operating assets go up by 100 and our enterprise value goes up by 100 as well. So that's how you would walk through and answer a question like this. Now, once again, I'll add a disclaimer here, yes, Equity value and enterprise value refer to market values. And we know that there's a difference, a big difference usually, between market value and book value for these items. Obviously, equity value is normally much higher than common shareholders' equity. But in these questions, we only care about the changes to these items. If one train is going much faster than another train, and they both decrease in speed by 10 miles per hour, then the change is the same for both. One is still going much faster than the other, but they change their speeds by the same amount. And that's why we care about these concepts. We can use the changes on the financial statements to answer them. So yes, book value and market value are very different, but these questions are all about changes. And for simplicity and for interview questions, we assume that changes in the book value correspond to changes in the market value. A fifth question category here might be the impact of real life events on equity value and enterprise value. A common question is, a CEO picks up $100 in the street and adds it to the company's bank account. How do equity value and enterprise value change? This would be recorded as an extraordinary gain on the income statement flowing into cash and common shareholders' equity in the balance sheet because you get higher net income, which flows into common shareholders' equity. So if you ignore taxes, cash is up by 100, common shareholders' equity is up by 100, so equity value increases by 100, enterprise value stays the same because nothing operational changes. Now, if you want to include taxes in something like this, let's just go up and delete some of what we had in the previous example. If we have a $100 extraordinary gain and the company's tax rate is 25%, then net income will go up by 75. On the cash flow statement, net income is up by 75, nothing else changes. And on the balance sheet, cash is up by 75 and common shareholders equity is up by 75. So the only difference is that equity value will go up by 75 rather than going up by 100 if you include taxes. And if the company's tax rate is different, maybe it'll go up by 60 or 50 or some other number. But the point is, taxes just mean that it will go up by less than 100. 
The intuition here is that picking up cash on the street does not improve the company's core business at all, so it should not improve the company's current enterprise value. That's about it for this quick summary, so let's do a recap of everything here. The most important point is that you shouldn't memorize specific questions and answers. If you learn the principles, you can answer any question. Equity value represents the market value of everything a company has, its net assets, but only to equity investors, in other words, common shareholders. Enterprise value is the market value of the company's core business operations, but to all investors, equity, debt, preferred, and possibly others. You calculate equity value for public companies by taking diluted shares and multiplying by the current share price. To calculate enterprise value, you start with the company's current equity value, you subtract non-operating assets, and then you add liability and equity line items that represent other investors, such as debt, preferred stock, and non-controlling interests, for example. You can think of valuation multiples as per square foot or per square meter of values for houses. They let you normalize for companies' different sizes and compare them even if one company has higher or lower revenue or operating income than another company. If a metric deducts net interest expense and preferred dividends if applicable, you pair it with equity value. Otherwise, you pair it with enterprise value in the numerator. To decide whether equity value or enterprise value change for purposes of interview questions, think about whether or not common shareholders' equity changes. If it does, equity value also changes. If not, then equity value does not change. And then for enterprise value, think about whether or not net operating assets change. If they do, enterprise value changes. If not, enterprise value does not change. And again, we're talking about the changes here. Yes, the book value and market values are obviously very different. We're not saying they're the same. We're saying that for purposes of interview questions, you should assume that a change in one means a change in the other. And that's what this is all about. That's it for this lesson. Hopefully now you have a better idea of what to expect with interview questions on these topics and how you can use a few simple rules to answer them.